The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Paula Iselt. If you could come up. Did I pronounce it correctly, the last name? OK, perfect. So um, Paula flew in specifically for this summit, so we're thrilled about that. Paula is a filmmaker, director, and producer. She is the co-director and co-producer of Aftershock regarding U.S. mortality crisis, and you'll hear more from her. Uh, second panelist that I'm excited to introduce is Hannah lincoln Hofker. Hope I said that right, Hannah. Close enough. Tell me how it really is supposed to be said. Lincoln Hoker. Lincoln Hoker. Make sure you got that. She, uh, Hannah is the Chief Engagement Officer at Johnson, Shapiro, Sluit, and Cole, which is an entertainment industry firm many of you may have heard of. Hannah is also a political strategist and the co-founder of the LA Women's Collective. The third panelist I'm excited about is Sarah Treem. Come on up, Sarah. Woo. Sarah is a writer and producer. She um, is the creator of, the co-creator actually, and showrunner of The Affair, which received a Golden Globe. She also wrote for House of Cards, which got a Best Drama Series Emmy Award nomination. And um, I have to thank Sarah, as she knows, because Sarah really put this panel together. I cannot take the credit for it. So thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and my final panelist, and certainly not least, is um, Diana Witten. Come on up. <laughs> Diana is a documentary filmmaker and writer. Her premier feature documentary, Vessel, won South by Southwest Special Jury Prize for Political Courage. And she's going to have some interesting things to tell us about her documentary and how it applies to our topic today. So thank you for being there here today. So I just want to briefly, I'm a lawyer, so I can't help myself. I want to briefly give you a little context on the Dobbs decision. Some of you may not be aware of what this decision actually said. Oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in the second row is Judith Arcana, who is a Jane. So you may have seen her on, on main stage earlier. So, um, and, and apologize for my old school file cards, my kids would make fun of me. So um, Dobbs State Health Officer of the Mississippi Department of Health versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization is the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, shockingly. And it was argued in December 2021, and it was decided June 24th, 2022, so six months later. But that's the date that was on the decision, but it actually leaked in May. So we were aware of this decision in advance of it actually being formally the date of the decision. Now, what was interesting about this decision is that Jackson's Women's Health Organization alleged that an act violated um, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood of Southern uh, Southern um, Philadelphia versus Casey. And the petitioners defended the act, and the act was um, an act that had a very significant ban on abortion. And the petitioners defended the act on the grounds that, um, that uh, Roe v. Wade and Casey, I'm sorry, that, yeah, the petitioners, that it was wrongly decided. And they said that it was um, wrongly decided, and the Supreme Court and this is where it's kind of shocking. There were three things the Supreme Court looked at. So hear these words really carefully. The Supreme Court looked at whether the Constitution conferred a right of abortion. And they said the critical question was whether the Constitution, quote, properly understood and conferred a right to obtain an abortion. So it's really strange language. And they concluded that Casey had failed to properly analyze the grounds in Roe v. Wade. And they said that a proper application of stare decisis for the lawyers in the room would have required an assessment of the strength of the grounds on which Roe v. Wade was decided. They looked at some very important constitutional provisions. They looked at whether the Fourth Amendment gave a preference to liberty that protects a particular right. 
So looking at the Fourth Amendment and saying, does the Fourth Amendment really protect abortion? Now, there's nothing in the Fourth Amendment. It talks about liberty, but doesn't use the word abortion. They, uh, and that's what they, just, they said, right? There was no express reference to abortion. Then they looked at the right of privacy and made the same conclusion, that the right of privacy didn't necessarily confer a right of abortion. They also looked at the Equal Protection Clause and concluded it didn't apply either. So the impact of this decision, many, many people, and we'll talk about this today with this pa these panelists, can go beyond just, and as if, as if that's not enough, can go beyond Roe v. Wade, overturning of Roe v. Wade. And that's the big concern. The LGBTQ community is very concerned, as are other people concerned about other rights, because they're not expressly stated in the Constitution. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a little context for it. So now I want to turn to this illustrious panel and talk about the entertainment industry, because that's what we're focused on, the entertainment industry's response to Roe v. Wade. So um, I'd like to start with um, Sarah. Um, I'd like to hear from you, you know, your reaction, first of all, on a personal level, when you heard this decision was, this monumental decision was overturned. And then um, when you saw what the, how the entertainment industry was responding, what you thought of that response? Well, I think on a personal level, it was grief, um, which I think was a pretty common response, at least the, from what I, um, from what I kind of collected among my friends and colleagues. Um, I think we knew it was coming, obviously, for a long time, um, but the actual, uh, the actual Dobbs decision, I, I think, has inspired a, a lot of grief in people and some despair um, and, you know, rage. Um, so, so what happened, I can only really speak for what happened among the, my peers who are showrunners, but what happened there happened very quickly, um, where uh, I sent out an email basically right after Dobbs to like 12 people saying, you know, maybe we should talk about this, maybe we should have a Zoom, maybe we should talk about how our industry might react to, um, to this decision, and uh, just 12 friends basically, and then within a couple days, it was you know, people had invited other people. We organized the Zoom, we were up to 100. Within a couple weeks after that, we were up to 400. I mean, the response was really quick in terms of people wanting to come together and do something. And, and, and you know, for a group of people who are not used to organizing in any, you know, mostly kind of lone wolves because we all run our, our own television shows, it was. It was sort of astonishing and unprecedented. So I think maybe that gives you a little bit of an indication of how strongly people felt right. um, in the aftermath. Yeah. Right, and we're going to go deeper um, in a few moments. We'll go deeper into the showrunner coalition that you're talking about and what it's been doing. And I just want to say one thing to everybody in the room that um, so the showrunner coalition speaks in one voice. And so when Sarah talks about the showrunner co um, uh, coalition or Hannah talks about it or anyone else on the panel, they're really not talking as a spokesperson. They're providing information for you, but the panel, the coalition speaks in, in one kind of anonymous voice. Um, so I want to make that clear. Uh, okay, so going back for a second, Sarah. So, you know, the entertain you and I talked about this in the prep for this panel today, that as an entertainment industry labor lawyer, um, when I first saw and heard, and really just primarily through the trades, um, the reporting about what the companies were doing, how they were acting, reacting to the overturning of Roe v. Wade, I went to this positive place. I went to this place of, wow, that's so great. The, the companies have come out. They, um, they've announced that they're going to, they're looking at policies. They're going to do a, a travel reimbursement. And I even talked to a couple reporters in a very positive way having not met all of you and talked to all of you as I have over the past few days. Um, and that was from the perspective of someone who knows that sometimes it takes so long for companies to, you know, analyze something, to figure out what position they're going to take. And often companies are looking at what other companies are doing as well, so that takes a while too. And then there's a whole hierarchy of getting approvals. So I came from this really positive places, you know, of great for our industry, they quickly came out on this. And I think, you know, from the perspective that you shared with me, that's really not the view that a lot of the women, and I think I just heard some laughter in the audience, um, that's not really the view that a lot of women, and probably men too, in our industry had. So can you talk a little bit about that? 
Well, right, so I can't talk about the industry at large, and I probably can't even talk about, I can only talk for myself. Okay, that's um, right. But I think that, uh, that, yeah, I mean, travel, uh, you know, the ability to for travel reimbursement, which is really what people are talking about um, in terms of, like, the, 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 the things that the companies came out with right away. Um, sure, that's great to be reimbursed if you travel to get an abortion, but it really is kind of the bare minimum of, of protecting um, the rights of women and people who can get pregnant if they're working in abortion hostile states, which was the which was the primary concern um, that we had as employers and people who work in an itinerant industry where you move to for a job. Um, so and and honestly, for I, I think Hollywood was not really leading that charge either. In a lot of ways, we were you know like the tech industry had come out before we did, and and actually a lot of law firms had already come out with those kind of. Uh, Promises, so um, so no, it didn't necessarily feel like you know. There's a lot of people who um, who were personally outraged in Hollywood, but it didn't necessarily feel at the time like Hollywood was leading a charge. And, yeah, I might just oh, sorry, mic huh. check. <clears throat> I might just say too that I think this earthquake of a decision transcended like oh, we need to evaluate, we need to make calculations about how we're going to respond and. You know, I think that the people affected, which is everyone, um, expected a response, you know, equal to the earthquake that it was, which is these are fundamental human rights. This is health care. How can we say that half the people in this country are second class citizens? And um, I think that the expectation from leaders, call them companies, call them politicians, leaders of many types was like stand for human rights, stand for like the gravity with which this moment calls for. And so I think some of the maybe disappointment um, within our industry and you know, there were some companies and individuals who you know, nailed it, but I think the expectation was, I think we need to do more. Right, and I remember we talked about um, you know Lionsgate and uh, John Feltheimer, the CEO, coming out. And I've got a quote in a in a weekly letter to the staff that didn't just mention travel. Um, it said, you know, the company will prioritize and protect reproductive rights in light of the Dobbs decision, develop strong policies, add to comprehensive benefits to protect reproductive rights. And I know you were all saying that that was a, that was a good, very good step in the right direction in terms of how a company came out and responded. Yeah, but that was in, that was in response to the showrunners coalition coming out and, and demanding certain things from the company. So that wasn't something that they, I mean, we were thrilled that Lionsgate took that stance, but that wasn't something that they did immediately in the wake of Dobbs. That took a couple months, and it was only, I think, in response to public pressure. Right. Well, the showrunners called on all of the studios and streamers to, you know, come forward with proactive plans and policies to protect their workers' rights, especially in the states that are banning abortion. And a lot of the responses were pretty lackluster. Mm -hmm. um, and Lionsgate's, I think, I think John's statement was the strongest in response. Um, yeah, it was, and, and, and the, the studios, for the most part, were, were hoping to speak as a group and were communicating through the MPAA, and Lionsgate basically separated themselves out and released their own internal statement to their employees, but it felt like it was a response to the pressure that was coming from, from the group. Um, so yeah, so it was incredibly admirable, um, but it did, it did have, it took a couple months to get that out. You know, and I told all of you, I was, um, I was trying to get some, some leaders, some labor leaders from some of the companies to be on the panel. I always like panels to be very balanced, but because this is an ongoing dialogue, I was not able to get to them to do that. Um, also was hoping to get some of the guilds and unions to be on the panel as well. The guilds and unions did come out with some um, stronger statements condemning and talked about some of the things that they might be doing. But I think what, you, what the coalition has been doing is really less focused on getting the guilds and unions to do something. It's more on getting the companies to do the things that you need them to do. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit, a little bit deeper detail. And it was public. It was Many of you may have seen three letters that were written by the, by the coalition that were sent to the major studios and streamers. 
And um, there were three different letters, and they asked for different things. And I know you can't go into sort of where things are now, um, but I think it would be really interesting for those who are not familiar with what the coalition has been trying to accomplish, um, what some of those things are that you are asking companies to do. And again, it's in, it's in press, so some of you may have read this. Well, should we kind of like maybe zoom out for one second and just talk about the reality, the national like landscape on this? Because I think everyone knows, but there, because of Dobbs, the federal protection went away, and now each state gets to determine their own laws, their own position on abortion, and you know women's <laughs> reproductive health across the board. Um, and there are, are a lot of states that have made clear where they stand. They've either banned it. Um, or heavily restricted it, or states like California that have protected and expanded rights and access, and, and even before this, but then in light of this, I think gone above and beyond to make it a, a safe place for people to um, make these decisions. But then there are a lot of states where it's also still up for debate, um, and I think that the mid we can talk about the midterm ele elections in a minute, but as it relates to production in these states, you know, showrunners, studios are, are responsible for saying, you're all gonna go work in Texas where they have like vigilante laws. <laughs> um, and so you're, you're putting humans, like your employees and people you're hiring and, and people, maybe you're coming from California, maybe you're people working there locally, but you're asking people to go work in states where they don't have fundamental human rights or access to healthcare and people's life events happen while they're on set. Um, right, so. and I, I had felt sort of personally um, affronted by it because I had, was pregnant during much of my uh, production experience um, and was incredibly reliant on maternal health care um, and, you know, and was never home. Um, so going to a state that didn't have... Uh, that you know, where abortion had become criminalized, if I if I had been asked to do that um, while I was pregnant, would have given me significant pause, which would have probably meant that I would not have gone, which would have cost me as a, you know, it would, would have cost me literally financially, would have hurt my career. So, I think I was not. I'm not the only woman who has ever had to, you know, it was a childbearing age who's moving for for a production, um, and so the idea was if we don't do something and if the studios and the companies don't actually step up to do more than just moving people out of state if they decide to have an elective abortion, what you're doing is basically creating an a, a unbalanced situation where people who can get pregnant um, are being asked to work in states where they actually might be putting themselves at risk. And that's not fair. Yeah. And it's yeah. not just abortion, and Paul and that's I were right. talking yeah. about this yesterday, but a lot of the same states that have banned abortion also have the worst maternal health outcomes, um, both in terms of women and children dying during childbirth and not having access to care. So I don't know, Paula, maybe you want to jump in here. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. is the most dangerous place in the industrialized world to give birth in. So women um, are dying in childbirth at really high numbers. It's only gone up in the past 25 years. And black and indigenous women die three times the rate of white women. So that's the landscape um, we are in now before Dobbs. And now after Dobbs, that number um, is expected to rise 21% um, overall in maternal mortality and 33% for black women. So... It's we already we're in a, cr a maternal health crisis, and this only makes it much much worse, of course. Right, and it's not just again leaving for an elective abortion. <laughs> it's what if you get pregnant and you have an ectopic pregnancy and you need emergency health care and you're in a state where that's illegal um, or criminalized. It, again, it's just it's it's creating a a a imbalanced situation. We we thought it was creating an imbalanced situation for employment. Um, for for people who can get pregnant and people who can't, um, right, so that's that was those were the that that was the focus of the letters, right? We were we felt that that we as employers, you know, sort of managers in in our industry, um, were being asked to uh, to 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 bring people into uh, into jurisdictions where they they could be endangered and making them choose between their jobs and their health. Which did not seem fair, and also didn't seem like a, a didn't seem like a choice that an individual should be asked to make. It seemed like something 
it seemed that the company should have policies and procedures to protect their employees if they're asking them to go shoot in those jurisdictions. Right, and I think your asks um, in the various letters really reflect the myriad of issues. And that's why when we were saying, you know, the company's coming out with, we'll reimburse for the travel if you have to leave the state, the kind of asks you had really um, cover the myriad of issues with protecting privacy and the criminality issue that was mentioned a minute ago, you know, defending and indemnifying if there's some type of criminality. Um, and and, um, and then also, um, I thought one of the interesting things, and I know you can't really comment on it, but it was in the letters, was just the discontinuing making the political contributions to individuals that are anti-abortion and, and to PACs. Um, but I think you were also focused on exactly what you were talking about, too, like job security and this, um, this imbalance. And then also retaliation. And I know some of you... Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Some of you don't, didn't necessarily think that might happen. It's something that got my alarm to go up working with, with companies, you know, to make sure that nobody is retaliating against a woman who is on a production who needs an abortion and has to, you know, have these, these additional things to enable her to be able to leave that production and need time off. And so it's not just the expense of it, it's actually she needs time off. Or like you said, it's not just an abortion, it could be some other pregnancy-related care. But so. I think that that speaks to the problem with that response and strategy to begin with. Why should someone be forced to tell their employer and get reimbursed to make this most personal health decision? And ultimately, like, this is a massive failure of our laws, our legal system, our political system, you know, and I think, like, maybe if we want to talk about the state-by-state -state landscape, we can, but... Yeah, and it's not, it's, it, none of these, um, none of these, uh, Nothing, none, like employment practices are not usually this clear. So, so for example, on my show, when we were first starting out, I had a costume designer who was pregnant on the pilot and then was, uh, was going to give birth during the, the, the production itself. And the, the um, assumption was that she would be replaced because she was going to have babies. So we couldn't, and, and my feeling as a boss at that point was like, that's insane. We don't, we're not, we don't fire women for having children. Um, so no, we're not gonna replace her. We're gonna use our assistant costume designer until she's ready to come back. But that's the, that's the you know, if, you're, if you start to consider people who can get pregnant as liabilities in, in productions in abortion hostile states, you know, you, nobody's gonna say directly, let's not hire that person because they are pregnant, can get pregnant, you know, are of childbearing age, whatever. It's just that, as I said, people will start self-selecting out right. of dangerous situations. And you might actually have employers who start sort of making different decisions, whether they're even conscious of it both. or not. I think you'd have both. Yeah. I think, I think and, I, and like I said, my, my antenna's up for that with my clients. You know, I will, I will clearly be advising my clients not to make those kind of choices, right? Um, and I, and you've, you were talking about, uh, you know, privacy and not reporting. You don't necessarily want to report to your employer. Um, and so I know there was also talk of, uh, of a hotline, as something also, a 24-hour hotline as uh, something that could also be very useful in the industry. And I remember Women in Film was doing during the whole Time's Up, you know, was doing the sexual harassment um, reporting hotline as well. So I know that's something you're also exploring. And I think some of the companies, what I saw in the press, some of the companies were actually saying, okay, that's something we think, you know, would make sense and we, we could be able to do. Well, I want to switch now. We have two other topics I want to cover before we run out of time. We could talk about this forever. Um, so I want to switch now to, and you hit on it a little bit, Hannah, and then we're going to get to, I promise we're going to get to Paula and we're going to get to Diane. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what you were talking about, Hannah, just other strategies like legislation, tax incentives, what Gavin Newsom's been doing in California. Um, so I, so with the national landscape and our industry works obviously all across the country, all across the world. So our companies and productions are tasked with navigating individual state laws across the board. And um, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, over the last you know 10 or 15 years, a lot of production has moved to other states because those states have incentivized production to come there. While some of the states that have really, I think, benefited from that have also banned abortion. And so. Um, you know, each state is determining what they're going to do on abortion now that Roe has been overturned. And like I said before, some of those states it's still up for debate and some it's not. Um, 
And I think it's easy to focus on the dark places and the bad places. And there are a lot of um, you know, bad things happening in this country right now. Um, but there are also a lot of good things. And I think that, there, that a lot of, of good has actually happened since Dobbs in terms of public support um, for abortion, people being, like, just knowing that it's a majority opinion in this country now, like, we've seen that both in terms of electoral outcomes, um, also in terms of polling, um, which I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that it's, like, 70 to 80 percent support uh, for choice, I mean, depending on how you, you phrase it, um, but that it's, it's actually, pop, abortion is not popular in terms of having one, but support for it is. Um, and our elections from the Kansas ballot initiative to the midterms, I think that really kind of panned out. Um, but you know, you're seeing states like California be a real leader. And it's not just the governor, it's the legislature, it's organizations like Planned Parenthood um, who have ramped up in order to receive patients from all over the country who need to come here for care. Um, but even in terms of our industry, you know, the governor announced that he was pushing for an expansion of the film and tax, TV tax credit program to 1.65 billion, a program that's already been funded, but he's saying, C production, come back to California, come where it's safe for your employees to be and work and live, and also, like, you'll still have access to tax credits, you don't have to suffer economically, um, if you get one of the tax credits. And I think that's really big. I think when companies are it's figuring out... more to out, get now, yeah. so when, that's... Yeah. When yeah. companies are figuring out where to, you know, where to produce, um, you, you as, a, as the Showrunners Coalition, you know, we've talked about, you, there's a moral imperative, there's a health imperative, there's all kinds of reasons not to be in these states or if you're going to be in these states to have these policies in place. But before you even get into those states, making the decision where you're going to go, the tax incentives are a big thing. I hear that all the time from my clients. Um, just briefly, because I want to get to content. You know, we talked about boycotts a little bit and just sort of the pros and cons of boycotts. Um, so just if we could hit that for just a minute. I don't know um, which of you would like to hit it, and then I want to move to content. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this. We actually think that boycott, the boycott question is a little bit, we're sort of past that moment now. Um, it's, it was something that was talked about a lot in the beginning, but um, I think that people come down on, on two different sides for very good reasons. Um, you know, there's, there's this idea that boycotts do work, so if a whole industry said we're not going to go shoot in these states anymore, that would be a powerful force. But um, but I think the, the counter-argument, which is also incredibly valid, is that um, if you leave these states, then you're basically moving states, you're, you're, you're leaving states that were potentially even moving purple, um, and you're kind of abandoning them, and you're um, you're bringing you're taking production out of them, and and the people who would maybe be voting to turn the state purple are going to leave as well. And so I think what we just saw happening in Georgia is a good example. Exactly. The Senate, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the runoff is a good example yeah, of why you don't boycott. Exactly. And I think Georgia is kind of like a good case study to look at across the board on this because Georgia has banned abortion, um, and they also just reelected their Republican governor, but then they, you know, have sent. They have two Democratic U.S. senators um, that they've sent to Washington, and it's truly a purple state. And also, as I'm sure everyone here knows, there is you know a huge section of our industry is based there now. And so, um, as with my like political consultant hat on, the concept of a boycott takes me to to what end, right? Like. Like, is it painful enough to move the needle, or are the people who are harmed by it the people who, you know, are already being harmed by these bad laws right. and losing jobs and yeah. being further, like, economically impacted? But also, like, there are, you know, I think more strategic ways to flex that muscle and influence that if you're still there, if you're in the fight, if you're one of the biggest employers in the state or just a big employer and you go and you're already meeting with the governor of the state and you're saying, hey, by the way, our production needs da 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 and our employees need basic human rights. So you're in the conversation versus just pulling out of it and not participating. Right. Well, now I know it's old school, and I'm not going to talk about boycotts anymore. Um, okay, so I want to switch to content because I like to end on a positive note. And so um, I'd like Paula, um, I'm sorry, we'll get to you in a second. Um, so Diane, I'd love to get you talking a little bit about Vessel because very impactful what you did. So if you could share with everyone about that 
amazing documentary. Sure, yeah. I mean, a lot of what came up in the Showrunners Coalition was normalizing and centering abortion stories um, in our industry. And I made a film called Vessel a number of years ago. It's a documentary that follows the work of Rebecca Gompertz, who you may have read about recently, but she sails a ship around the world to countries where abortion is illegal and brings women into international waters where it's safe and legal for her to give the abortion pill. And uh, it causes a fair amount of publicity. And what's underneath that publicity, basically it's a Trojan horse, is she leads people to this website, a sister organization called Women on Web. And what Women on Web do does is women from around the world for years now, almost two decades, uh, 2008 I think it started, have been writing to this organization when they need the pills. And they mail the pills to women and they talk them through the experience with con consulting online, um, consultation online. So it's, um, it's, and for many years, Rebecca wouldn't work in the States, in her words, because it was the most litigious and the most violent place in the world. Um, but that changed when Trump was elected, and she started working in the States under, the, um, under a company called Aid Access, which essentially is Women on Web in the United States. Um, Aid Access is one of the only organizations at this point that's mailing into hostile states. Um, but there are a lot of similar organizations that are helping get the word out, like how to use these pills, how to teach people that the pills are safe and effective, and thinking of other really creative and um, sort of irreverent, fun ways to bypass these, these inhumane laws and think about loopholes, legal loopholes, um, direct action loopholes, um, and ways to get women in hostile states these pills. Um, Another thing that was interesting, you know, you just mentioned about like legal loopholes and the panel um, this morning that um, that Judith was part of really talked about um, law and how like, interpreting the law and so interpreting the existing law in a way, like you said, a loophole or something you feel like allows you to do this, you have some defense, but also just busting through the law when you feel like you have to. So, so I want to get to Paul before we have to finish and I just... Um, I, you know, it was so brave of you to, and I know you probably didn't think of yourself that way when you were doing all this, but it was very brave of you to do that documentary. And um, you mentioned to me there was an incident that happened involving the documentary. And so if you could talk just briefly about that screening. Yeah, for the most part, it was, there wasn't a lot of violence attached to the documentary screenings, but there were a couple, I mean, there's a fair amount of emails I received uh, forcefully encouraging me to stop the work. <laughs> Um, but there was a, um, in Sweden of all places, you wouldn't have expected it, but there was a smoke bomb in the middle of a screening and two people went to the hospital, they were fine. But yeah, it was- Did you feel, can keep filming? Did you film any of that? Well, that was at a screening of the film. Uh, right, but, yeah. uh, no, but you as a documentary filmmaker, there's a oh. screening, so I'm wondering if you were uh, I actually pulled wasn't, out your, I wasn't even at your, that one. even your iPhone, so. Yeah. But yeah, no, that was, that was one of the more dramatic responses for the most part. So I want to shift to Paula real quickly, um, because you flew all the way out here, and we're getting to last. Um, you know, and, and the point is, like, content is so important for informing and having impact, and so I'd love you to talk about what you're doing in your projects. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, as I discussed briefly before, there's a U.S. maternal mortality crisis. So we're in a, I, there's a U.S. maternal mortality crisis, and I want to just say again that it's all connected, like abortion cares, maternal health care, it's all one conversation. It's not like this, you know, of course Dobbs is a horrible moment, but we've been in crisis with really bad maternal health care for a long time, so this is part part of that that's been going on. And um, I made a film uh, last year that premiered at Sundance called Aftershock, and since its Sundance premiere, um, the impact from just seeing and experiencing what is it like when a mother is lost, the ripple effect of a preventable, prevented, preventable maternal death, because 85% of these deaths are prevented. And since that film came out, um, we've been across the country at hospitals, insurance companies, institutions that are really looking to change the way their practice is contributing to this crisis. So great. That's fantastic. And you have another project you're working on now. Are you able to just mention it? 
Yeah, and um, so most recently I directed a short film called Under God that's going to be premiering at Sundance um, in a couple of weeks, and that is about a creative legal strategy that states can take to combat the Dobbs decision. So what it does, um, it's inspired by a lawsuit in Florida where a rabbi in his synagogue sued the state of Florida saying that the abortion ban was an infringement on their religious freedom. And these cases have come up in other states and in Indiana, it just a judge just ruled that um, their abortion ban was a violation of religious freedom it was brought by a group of Jews and Muslims and uh, uh, someone with a personal religion. So these laws work. It's a way of flipping the script. Um, these laws called RIFRAs, uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, have been used to oppress LGBTQ people. That's where the, that whole Baker situation, Hobby Lobby, all comes from that law. So now um, there's a, a amazing community activists and lawyers that are flipping the script on that and saying, well, if that's an, a religious, if that's an infringement on your religious freedom, this abortion ban is an infringement on mine. So, so important. So that's important. It. So real quickly, just a uh, quick action item from everyone. Action item for people before they Can, um, I, can I ask leave. Paula a question? Is yeah. that okay? Yeah. So how did you, how, how did you come up with it? I mean, how did you get to this? First of all, how did you get to Aftershock? Because I, I, Aftershock was extraordinary. And I'm just wondering actually how you got to those families. And then, and then, can you just tell Thank me about you. how you got to the new yeah. short? Yeah. So Aftershock's a longer story, but I, um, as a filmmaker and as a mom, I had my own adverse experiences in the maternal health system. So it was something I was in tune with, but it wasn't until 2017 when ProPublica came out with the Lost Mother series that I understood that we were in crisis and that black women were dying three times the rate of white women and that we were the most dangerous place in the Western world to give birth. And when I read those stories, um, especially about Shalon Irving, who was a CDC epidemiologist who died three weeks postpartum because she wasn't seen and heard, I just felt um, as a storyteller, um, I wanted to use my skill set to uplift those stories. And with Under God, you know, we're talking about how we've all wanted to take action in the industry. And so after Shock, I was like, in mid-release, like about to release it with Hulu, and um, a few friends, or really one friend, um, Roddy Taylor, who um, is from Concordia Studios, called and said, we need to do something, I'll get you funding, we have to make a film about what's happening. And really, just a bunch of amazing women, um, funders came together, we made this short in five months, and just captured those stories and, and hopefully. So they said changed. we have to wrap up. They've actually even come forward to tell me we have to wrap up. I told you we could talk about this forever. So instead of your action item as part of our panel, I encourage you, you're amazing women. I've had the pleasure of talking to you, as I said, for the last couple of days, getting to know you, hearing your great ideas and everything you're doing. Stay, be among the group as at, at the summit. Share with them, you know, anyone who's interested, seek them out. Share with them your thoughts about how people, I mean, obviously the people that are here care about this issue. There's other people at the summit that care about this issue. Share with them your thoughts about how they can each figure out how to be active in this very, very important cause. So thank you so much. Can't thank you enough. And thank you to all of you for coming.